and welcome to today's lecture on Ptolemaic Egypt. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we're going to talk about Egypt's longest lasting dynasty, which it turns out wasn't ruled by Egyptians at all. Starting at the end of the 4th century BCE, the Greeks were able to take over Egypt, ruling from the new cosmopolitan city of Alexandria. Along the way, we'll see an intricate and ever-evolving negotiation of royal power and identity, merging what it means to be a Greek ruler with what it means to be an Egyptian ruler. In a way, this is the same sort of negotiation that had happened throughout the Third Intermediate Period and the Late Period in Egypt. So, if you're trying to figure out how to fit in in a new place, you can either marry your sister or journey with me as we investigate Ptolemaic Egypt. The early days of Greek Egypt were a bit chaotic, to say the least. We've seen that Alexander established Greek control over Egypt in 332 BCE, when he took a detour from his march against the Persian king Darius III to check out the land of the pyramids and pharaohs. Upon showing up, the Persian satrap, that's their word for governor, didn't even put up a fight. He gave Alexander the keys to the kingdom, and very literally the keys to the treasury, and lived to fight another day. And this was a very smart move. Actually, Alexander rewarded him by making him part of the new administration. So Alexander went to check out the old kingdom capital of Memphis. And then he went north to found a new city, Alexandria. Naming it after himself shouldn't be a surprise. He actually either founded or renamed 70 different cities after himself during his 13-year campaign. Then he headed west to the Siwa Oasis, where it said that the Oracle of Zeus Ammon said that he was the son of a god, something the Greeks didn't really take too kindly to. Anyway, Alexander had a nice productive tour through Egypt, all in less than a year. Afterwards, Alexander continued on his campaign against Darius, and even after defeating him, he pushed into unknown lands, making it all the way to India. When his troops threatened a mutiny, he began to march back to Greece, with thousands of troops dying along the way in the middle of the Gedrosian Desert. Alexander made it to the famous city of Babylon, but there he took sick, perhaps from drinking too much. Upon his deathbed, his generals visited him, telling him he'd built the greatest empire the world had ever seen, and asking him which of them he was going to leave the empire to. Who would be the next great leader? So Alexander, barely audible on his deathbed, responds that he's leaving his empire to the strongest, which of course is no help to any of them, and it's certain to cause all sorts of chaos. So Perdiccas, one of Alexander's generals, ruled on behalf of two of Alexander's relatives, who were too young at the time to rule. So that was his half-brother and his infant son. Ptolemy was another general, and he entrenched himself as the governor of Egypt, ostensibly serving these two underage kings. But it didn't take long, however, for Ptolemy to overthrow any allegiance to Alexander's family or to any of the other generals, and then he proclaimed himself the new king of Egypt.
Ptolemy, at this point, is left with the question, how do you govern a land where you've never lived? Inhabited by people who have an entirely different religion and language and culture than you do. As we've seen again and again, it's important to symbolically solidify one's power and one's right to rule. And it's especially important to justify one's right to rule when you're an outsider, just like Ptolemy was in Egypt. So as his first order of business, Ptolemy hijacks the dead body of Alexander while it was on its way back to Macedon. And he buries Alexander in Egypt. I guess with the idea that like possession is nine-tenths of the law. He has the body, he's the rightful heir. And this was actually a long-standing tradition in Macedon, that whoever buried the previous king had the right to the throne. Now, Alexander's tomb was visited by some of history's most prominent figures. So we have Julius Caesar and Cleopatra and Augustus and Caligula. They all come to visit him. Its location, however, has been lost to the sands of time. And despite more than 100 expeditions in Alexandria, the tomb of Alexander has never been found. Ptolemy went further to establish himself as Greek king and Egyptian pharaoh. He took the epithet of Soter, which means savior in Greek, literally calling himself the savior of the Egyptian people. But how would native Egyptians, who speak the local language, get the message that Ptolemy I was indeed the Soter, or savior, if they can't read or speak Greek? Well, just like a good lecture, you better have some visuals to accompany the text. Ptolemy is, of course, a Greek guy and he frequently depicts himself as such. His depiction on coinage and in sculpture looks just like what you'd expect, a big beefy Greek dude wearing a diadem of power. In addition to these traditional Greek depictions, however, we also see Ptolemy depict himself as a traditional pharaoh of ancient Egypt. So in this basalt statue, now housed in the British Museum, we can see Ptolemy looking just like a good Egyptian pharaoh should look, wearing the royal headdress and having the physical features of an Egyptian rather than a Greek ruler. And in this sculptural relief right here uh, from the Royal Ontario Museum, we can see Ptolemy, or his successor Ptolemy II, it's still a little bit debated, depicted once again in classical Egyptian garb. So on the one hand, Ptolemy is sending the message to the rest of the Hellenistic world that he is indeed a Greek king ruling Egypt. But on the other hand, he's also sending a message to the Egyptian people that he's an Egyptian pharaoh following a tradition that has lasted more than a thousand years. Now, one of the reasons that Ptolemaic rule in Egypt was successful is that the first ruler, Ptolemy I Soter, lived and ruled for nearly 40 years. So by the time he died, there just weren't that many people left who remembered how things used to be. And those that were left would have remembered Persian rule prior to Ptolemy. Anyway, long reigns are great for establishing a good kingdom or dynasty. Upon Ptolemy I's death, power passed to his biological son, Ptolemy II, who had the nickname Philadelphus. And we'll see what that means in just a second. One thing we can see is that Ptolemy II was carrying out many of the same ruling strategies as his father. So here, he's depicted like a traditional Egyptian pharaoh in a granite statue now housed in the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore. But that's not all. Let's just say that Ptolemy II was particularly committed to the portray myself like an Egyptian cause. So to demonstrate this, he adopted the ancient Egyptian practice of sibling marriage by marrying his full sister, Arsinoe II. And that's how he got his nickname, Philadelphus, which can be translated from the original Greek as sister lover. Eesh. Now, from our perspective, that's pretty messed up. But Ptolemy II was actually drawing upon an ancient Egyptian practice here. King Tut, for example, was married to his half-sister, Anonxen Amun. 
But that doesn't settle why Egyptian kings were practicing this in the first place. So take a second and think about why that might be the case. And if you came up with, this was a strategy to preserve the purity of the royal bloodline, well, you'd be right. So Ptolemy II wasn't just portraying himself as Egyptian, he was also maintaining the purity of the Ptolemaic bloodline. Just remember that next time someone says it's good to be the king. Ptolemy II wasn't just some weirdo, though. He was actually an incredibly effective ruler. And a big part of what he did was bring Egypt into contact with the rest of the Mediterranean through the sharing of arts and knowledge. It was at Alexandria that Ptolemy II began construction on the Great Library, one of the most influential centers of knowledge and learning in the ancient world. At its peak, the library held tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands, of books that were written on papyrus scrolls. In the famous lighthouse of Alexandria, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, was also constructed by Ptolemy II. It was renowned for its massive scale, nearly 500 feet tall, and it was topped by a statue of Zeus with a uh, fire lighting the way for ships sailing into the city of Alexandria. We call this chronological period, starting with the death of Alexander and the rule of his successors, the Hellenistic world because it led to a mixture of Greek rulership and aristocracy and culture with local customs throughout the Near East and Egypt. So when you hear Hellenistic world, think Greekish or Greek-esque after the word for Greece, Hellas. And part of the success of Ptolemaic rule was that their ruling strategies weren't just about grand ideas at the highest level of society they impacted the regular fabric of Egyptian culture just as much. Let's get back to this idea of brother-sister marriage, for example. One of the crazy things is that this practice of brother-sister marriage actually trickled down to regular people as well. Marriage records preserved on ancient Egyptian papyri, that's that kind of ancient Egyptian form of paper made out of reeds, uh, they indicate that something like one in five marriages was between a brother and a sister. Personally, out of all the royal attributes I would adopt, I think I'd avoid that one. But hey, you know, that's just me. The Ptolemies also actively promoted religious aspects that linked Greek and Egyptian cultures. This blending of religions is known as syncretism, and it's best exemplified by the creation of the Greco-Egyptian god Serapis. Serapis was a combination of the Egyptian gods Osiris and Apis, with the Greek god Zeus, Hades, Demeter, and Dionysus. And this new god was actively developed and promoted by the Ptolemies as a way to unify cultures and establish authority. Visually, Serapis looked like a classic Greek god, almost like Zeus or Hades. But upon closer inspection, you can see Egyptian elements such as the basket of grain on his head, or the uraeus, or the snake diadem. And Serapis isn't the only example. Isis, the Egyptian wife of Osiris, becomes associated with Demeter and with Aphrodite. And she's often depicted as the Greek goddess, but with horns and an Egyptian solar disk. And Horus, the son of Isis and Osiris, morphs into the Greco-Egyptian god Harpocrates most frequently portrayed as, like, a little delightful chubby baby boy. And all these hybrid cultural practices, from marriage to religion, they played out in a series of new towns, like Karanis, which you see here, where Greek citizens and soldiers would have lived alongside the native Egyptian population, furthering the process of cultural integration. But even the most well-planned ruling strategies can't preserve a single dynasty forever. Revolts by native Egyptians against the Ptolemies weren't uncommon, and some were fairly formidable. Starting in 205 BCE, two native Egyptians in Upper Egypt claimed to be pharaohs, 
starting a 20-year-long revolt against Ptolemaic rule. Remember that the U.S. Civil War was five years long. A 20-year-long revolt is a really long revolt. The political struggles between the Ptolemies and the Egyptian population, and between the Ptolemies themselves, were particularly devastating for two reasons. So first and most obviously, it eroded the power of the Macedonian monarchy. But second, and equally as influential in the long run, these Ptolemaic squabbles gave the burgeoning Roman Republic an opportunity to get involved in Egypt. Ptolemy XI, for example, was only able to gain the throne because he was placed there by the Roman general Lucius Cornelius Sulla. Decades later, around 50 BCE, civil war reared its ugly head once again. This time it was Ptolemy XIII, going against his sister and wife, Cleopatra VII. And if you're wondering, you're correct, that is THE Cleopatra. Rather than sharing power as a royal couple, they each wanted sole power for themselves. Ptolemy XIII looked to Rome for help, but his attempt to curry favor went horribly awry. Rome and Julius Caesar himself instead allied with Cleopatra. Caesar's alliance with Cleopatra eventually led to the downfall of Ptolemy XIII and the solidification of Cleopatra as the sole ruler of Egypt. Now, she was an absolutely fascinating leader in her own right, the first ever of the Ptolemies to learn the language of the ancient Egyptians. But ultimately, the rising power of Rome would be too much for the Hellenistic kingdoms. For centuries, they had squabbled with each other for the remnants of Alexander's empire. And when Rome came through, they were able to pick off the Hellenistic kingdoms one by one. In 31 BCE, in a move that would end the Roman Republic once and for all, and give rise to the Roman Empire, Egypt fell to Rome at the naval battle of Actium, bringing an end to the Ptolemaic dynasty. The Ptolemies are a fascinating case study in what happens when the ruling culture is completely different than the culture of the masses. In this case, the Ptolemies consistently worked to bridge the cultural gaps, letting other Hellenistic leaders know that they ruled Egypt and letting the Egyptian people know that they were just like them, the same as the pharaohs who had ruled Egypt for 3,000 years. Sometimes these symbolic messages were blatant, depicting the king in two different ways, as a Greek leader, as an Egyptian pharaoh. Sometimes they got pretty weird, like with the rise of brother-sister marriage once again. And sometimes they naturally fused cultural elements, like with religious syncretism and gods like Serapis. Just a couple lessons you can learn from Ptolemy Egypt. Egypt.